This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to The Commercial Investing Show, where we analyze, explain, and exploit the opportunities presented in today's commercial property marketplace. If you're interested in apartments, mobile home parks, self-storage facilities, and other income property, you've come to the right place. We'll explore what's hot and what's not in markets nationwide in the relentless pursuit of return on investment. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Yeah, it's my pleasure to welcome Matt Curtis. He is founder and CEO of Smart City Policy Group, otherwise known as SCPG. And he deals in a lot of interesting areas. And one is the short-term rental regulations and uh, so forth. So let's dive in. Matt, welcome. How are you? Oh, I'm terrific. Thanks so much. And you're coming to us from Austin, Texas. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Austin has really become the uh, hub for so many new innovations and new conversations about uh, new technologies and new ideas. That's true, but not Airbnb, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the climate is uh, rather anti-short-term rental in Austin, from what I understand. Well, you know, I mean, Austin's interesting. Austin is a lot of Airbnb started in Austin during South by Southwest yeah. and some other big festivals that we had here years ago. Of course, Austin was uh, home to HomeAway and headquarters to HomeAway mm -hmm. while they were operating as HomeAway um, and grew as HomeAway. And I was the head of HomeAway and later Expedia Global Government Affairs worldwide and uh, worked on short-term rental regulations around the world. Austin did create some regulations in 2013 that did a great job of achieving compliance with registration, getting mm -hmm. people into the program, but they recreated those rules back in about 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're having a harder time uh, achieving compliance with those. But like a lot of cities, they're going to continue to tinker with those rules and regulations until they get it right. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So tell the listeners what you do. You told me off air a little bit. It's pretty interesting. What do you do when someone asks you that at a cocktail party? What do you say? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's fascinating. I was the head of Homeway Global Government Affairs and Expedia there for a long time. And I was the short-term rental guy. And that was after I came on the heels of uh, my roles as deputy to the previous two mayors of Austin. And Austin was the it city in the world. So many people were looking at Austin, talking about Austin as the best practice mecca, a city that did so many things right. So I was talking about uh, you know, local government policy for a long time and then talking about short-term rental policy for a long time around the world. Now I've taken those two things and I created my own consulting practice. We're based here in Austin, but we've got a variety of different folks that work with us in Washington, D.C., in the Bay Area, in uh, different corners of the world, where what we're focused on is helping cities and travel organizations like destination marketing organizations and private sector entities create good policy. Mostly we're focused on short-term rentals. That's the anchor of our work, but we work on other emerging technologies as well. So we've done a lot of work on air taxis, ride hailing, scooters, and so on. Yeah, so air taxis meaning, uh, well, when I was at the uh, Cannes Film Festival year before last, I took Uber Copter twice. So I, I, I summoned a helicopter with my phone. It was a pretty cool experience. And that's what you mean when you say air taxis, right? Sort of. The yeah. next big thing, air taxis, electric vertical takeoff and landing jets, mm -hmm. it's a little different than a helicopter. Wow. It's actually a vertical flying jet that yeah. can land right on the rooftop of your development. So if you're an urban core real estate developer, mm -hmm. you're wanting to have a new electric vertical takeoff and landing jet pad right. on the roof of your building. This will be a new so amenity, people, a new search criteria yeah. in the MLS. Do you have the, oh, the vertical, what do you call it? Electric vertical takeoff and landing jets. Most people call them air taxis. Yeah, air and taxi are, landing uh, pad on my building. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And they're just a few years off in being seen in American cities but they're flying in different corners in the world. And people are talking about how this is going to change your ability to quickly get out to the airport mm -hmm. or quickly get out to the ballpark. Right. And you might spend a little bit more because uh, maybe that Uber takes cost $45 to get to the airport. Maybe you're spending $45 to get to the airport as well, but you're getting there in five or 10 minutes. Yeah, right, now there's right. five other people in the vehicle with you and they're all spending $45. So the total bill is a few hundred bucks to get out to the airport. But you're splitting that with all the other travelers. Yeah. And that's going to be really cool. And it's going to be neat to see that we're going to see the Jetsons 
in America in our lifetime. Yeah. Isn't that neat? It's an amazing time to be alive, as I always say. That's that's really cool. Yeah. When do you really anticipate that, though? You know, they've been talking about flying cars for decades, and we still don't have them. I mean, you know, what are we talking about? For real, really seeing that in the marketplace, your prediction. If you read just uh, you know general periodicals right now, you'll see that most people are talking about in the next few years. Mm-hmm. So probably you know I'm guessing three to five years off, you will see some activity flying in different American cities. Now some cities are going to be slow to allow this to be adopted. Some cities are going to create uh, you know very strict limits to it, so that most of these vehicles are going to be flying within existing helicopter flight paths. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to create anything new to allow them. Well, and these are self-driving too, right? Well, that's the goal at some point in the future Mm -hmm. is that they are artificial intelligence. But in the beginning, most American cities are probably going to say they have to have a pilot. And most Mm -hmm. of the companies that are creating them already are aware that they have to have piloted vehicles to get started. So like Lilium is one of those companies, right? They, they have the five-seater all-electric jet air taxi. Amazing. Yeah, well, we'll see. Can't wait to see that happen. Why is it difficult for cities and, you know, the constituencies there, right, the, the residents, to get their heads around short-term rentals? I, I mean, you know, I ultimately think even in cities that are in municipalities that resist this, it's going to win. It's kind of like the places that resist uh, ride hailing, you know, Lyft, Uber, et cetera. You know, it's going to ultimately win and it's going to be accepted, right? Is that, that's your thinking too, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, sure. But I also don't think that most cities are absolutely opposed or on the other side of short-term rentals winning. They're on the side of just trying to figure out what is good policy. And how do you create good policy that meets the demand of the community and meets the demand of the travelers? Very few cities have said no to short-term rentals all the way around. Most cities allow some amount of short-term rental activity. The problem that you have is a variety of things. Obviously, the traditional short-term rental industry that had been around for years was professionally managed, vacation rental managed properties in, in a lot of beautiful destinations that you would like to go. And professional property managers did an incredible job making sure that they were achieving compliance, paying taxes, and following all the rules and regulations. But all of a sudden, the internet allowed uh, people to rent out homes in cities that might not have traditionally been vacation destinations. So that might have brought people to more what I would call cities of interest, places that are cool places to go visit. You normally probably wouldn't pack up the family in the uh, station wagon and drive there, you know, back in the 70s. And now all of a sudden, you're able to rent properties in cities of interest, which I still think is important. It's the demand of the traveler. The challenge is, that you have not a lot of great practices out there to copy because there aren't a lot of great policies that have achieved compliance. And to be very fair, I think early on, we had probably the biggest player in the industry, Airbnb, which might not have been thinking clearly about long-term policy creation. I think there was probably a focus on growing the business. I love Airbnb, and I think they're doing a great job now of working with cities and DMOs on creating good policy. But I think 10 years ago, eight years ago, nine years ago, there was probably a lot of discussion around let's create policy in cities like San Francisco, Amsterdam, and New York, and Portland, where uh, primary home short-term rental was allowed. But the traditional vacation or property managed properties were not allowed. And I would argue that the cities probably should have taken the other approach. Allow the professional property managed style properties because then you know you're achieving compliance with those folks. And then if you wanted to add on other types of short-term rental activity, you could do that and certainly should consider doing that. But start with what is the most compliant core, the most compliant kind of center of the atom. Yeah. The thing is, though, we really got to take this from the homeowner's perspective. I remember when I lived in La Jolla, in San Diego, La Jolla, right? I would see signs in so many yards of these high-end homes, uh, a lot of them you know, homes that had been remodeled and that are all nice and, you know, been torn down and they built McMansions or 
houses that are just there in their original state where you can tell that the owners have lived there for decades and decades and decades and they're house wealthy now, right? Signs in the yards that say, you know, this is a neighborhood. It's not for short-term rentals, all kinds of things. Just And, and you know, I can see their point of view. Why do they want a bunch of transients next door to them making noise, you know, new neighbors every week? They want a stable neighborhood, right? So you can see it from both sides. Like on one side, I'm a capitalist and I like innovation. And, you know, they said it's a great new idea and a whole new economy really that's been created. But on the other side, you know, if I owned that $3 million house for the last four decades and uh, I want to stay there, I don't want to be disturbed by these transients in and out every weekend. Oh, it's tough. I mean, it's really a really tough thing. And I would even go a step further and point out that, you know, we had a global recession. We had a lot of housing stock that wasn't being built the way that it should have been. And we have cities, especially in America, that are operating with 60-year-old zoning codes and planning directives that really weren't addressing the changing demands for city housing stock. So you've got this strain on housing stock, and you've got these folks that you think are invading my neighborhood, and it becomes pretty easy to connect the dots and get to, you're impacting my housing value, you're driving up my property value, sometimes to the point of it's making it difficult for me to afford my property taxes, and you're also limiting the total amount of inventory in a community. Now, I actually don't believe that's true all the time. And I think that studies have shown that while it might be uh, a conversation that is being had, that overall the amount of housing stock that's really being impacted in many communities that are having this conversation, it tends to be less than 1% of the total housing stock and often less than 0.1% of the total housing stock in a community. That's a great point. So let's talk about a couple things there. Number one, from the supply side of the equation. Okay, so I uh, own a lot of rental investment property regular traditional long-term rental property, right? And I have really liked and tried to sort of move around and live in some different states and cities the past eight years or so. I just wanted to move around the country and see what it's like in different places to see where I ultimately want to live. And I tell you, when I moved to Florida last year, I wanted to do the same plan I'd been doing since 2011 when I gave up my big house in Orange County, California, and I rented. And I really enjoyed renting because you rent a high-end home and the rent-to-value ratio is so in favor of the tenant. It's wonderful. But this time, I couldn't find a decent place to rent. I wanted to find a nice high-end rental again and move in and and have that rent-to-value ratio very much in my favor as the tenant and own lots of little inexpensive properties that I rent to other people and the rent-to-value ratio is in my favor as the investor owner, right? So I considered that a nice arbitrage. This time, I couldn't find anything. And my theory is that they'd all been gobbled up by short-term rentals. Everybody's taking their high-end home, turning it into a short-term rental. And I was really discouraged. I had to end up buying a house, right? Which I really didn't want to do. That seemed to be true because I kept looking and looking and looking and, oh, will you rent this one out? No, we just want to do short-term rental. You know, we'll rent it in the summer when nobody wants to come to Florida. Uh, you can stay there for six months, but then you got to move because we can make too much money Airbnb being it in the high season in the winter, right? So right. that's one side. Yeah. Speak to that for a minute. And then I got another side to ask you about. Yeah, no, certainly, you know, and it's interesting. You got to look at it from the perspective of data. So uh, we're having a conference on August 16th, a Smart City Policy Summit. It's a conference on short-term rental regulations. And the housing analytics firm, RC Elco, is going to be releasing their latest study on the impacts of housing by short-term rentals. And when you look at some of these studies, you know, studies that are done by statisticians, you know, people who do the science of these sorts of things, they can be mind boggling, you know, 15 pages of stuff that might turn some of our heads inside out as we read them. But when you finally get down to it, it tends to be that, yeah, I mean, short term rentals are, are certainly involved in the overall real estate uh, uh, conversation. But more often than not, in cities like uh, Denver or, um, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, 
even a San Francisco or Los Angeles, the total number of short-term rentals is actually very active short-term rentals that are non-owner occupied, you know, professionally managed, someone's second home that people are fearing are stealing housing from the housing stock tends to be something in the neighborhood of like 0.001% of the overall housing stock. It sure doesn't feel that way. But okay. <laughs> well, so so it's it's challenging because yeah. what what I think a lot of folks will say it feels like in a Denver, for instance, where you have something in the neighborhood of four hundred thousand dwellings, is that maybe you had about four hundred non owner occupied or professionally managed short term rentals when they were having their regulatory conversation back in about two thousand fifteen. Why it might not feel that way is because you may have another two thousand owner-occupied primary short-term rentals where you do have stories of people who are rolling up and down the street with their bags looking for their house. I think the other big important uh, factor to discuss here is if this is the demand of the traveler, where else are we going to send them? Uh -huh. Because these people are now looking for the experience of staying in a neighborhood, staying in a nice apartment, yeah. staying in a home where they might be able to enjoy a Denver or a Nashville or a Los Angeles for several more days than their typical one night stay in a hotel, yeah. maybe two. Right. You know, the hotel stays in America, the average hotel stays in America was, was something like 1.2 nights. Mm -hmm. And the average number of guests was like 1.1. 1 .1. So it's one person staying for a night, maybe two, maybe you're with your partner or spouse. Mm -hmm. Well, now when you look at short term rentals, the average length of stay is like five and a half nights. Mm -hmm. You're with two or three people. So probably a family. Mm -hmm. And that means a huge economic impact for the community, sure. And, I, you know, a lot of folks say, well, it's, it's not worth it for the change in my community character. But at the end of the day, families now got the demand for that type of travel. And they're not going to take their wife and their child and stick them back in a small little 160 square foot box of a hotel room for several nights. It's just not going to happen. So how do you create good policy that achieves both? And I think you got to look to good operators that are operating great short-term rentals of all different types that speak to the demand of different travelers and then create policy that speaks to that. Okay, so a couple things. Number one, what you said may well be true on the stats, but what we find is that, yeah, maybe it's you know, a tiny percentage of the overall housing stock of the country or a given city, for example, or a metro area, but it's concentrated in the prime areas. That's the right. thing. If you want to live in a prime area, your housing stock has been, I'd say, I would argue, significantly impacted by this trend. Okay. So that's one thing you don't even have to respond. It's kind of rhetorical. Okay. But well, actually, no, no, yeah, no. Go no. Ahead. I, I would actually yeah. like to because I think okay. there's good. But, but I've got, I've got a whole other part of that discussion I want to have, which is on your last point. Okay. So go ahead. Well, and I just wanted to make sure, you know, you could create policy that limits the density of, of properties. Mm -hmm. And really, when we are talking about this, most of the time we're talking about residential zones, you know, single family homes, I don't know, think of it in the American South, like ranch style homes. We're probably not really talking so much about commercial mixed use multifamily because it seems that there is a consensus from American cities that that is a place where short-term rental activity could be allowed. It's a commercial mixed-use multifamily zone. You know, there are different... Uh, yeah, but that's not uh, going to give people the whole experience you just talked about. But you may, if you were, if you were a family traveling to an urban core, yeah, that sure. may answer the demand. It, most it most of those families want to go to the beach in La Jolla or Newport, you know, <laughs> so or, right. or Santa that's, Monica. That's, yeah, that's that's so, that's and, different. and you could solve that problem, the beach in La Jolla, by density limits, yeah. registration, licensure programs, things like that yeah, that yeah. could help mitigate the impact. But let's talk about the flip side of the equation, which I think is interesting. And I don't know how much you track this, but I wonder how much of it is a mania right? How much of it is just a fad? And when the next recession hits, it'll sort of settle it out and you'll see what's sort of really there. This is what I mean by that, okay? If you look at the hotel business and the number of room nights and you look at the development of hotels, which, you know, Airbnb is what, 10 years old, give or take, something like that. You know, of course you had others before them, but they 
really were the disruptor that kind of changed the industry, right? And if you look at the number of hotel nights consumed, and you look at the number of beds consumed in Airbnbs or bedrooms, right, consumed in the Airbnb market, you see that there's been a huge increase in both of those numbers coming out of the Great Recession for the last 10 years. Now, is it just that everybody's feeling really rich right now and so they're traveling a lot? Or have we really created a new market, a new type of traveler, a new concept of traveling? And to some extent, I absolutely think we have. And I think you just spoke to that. But the hotels are doing all right. And there's all this additional mm -hmm. new market of supply in the short-term right. rental world. What happens when the recession hits? You know, that has to go away, right? A large part of it. And there's new inventory in hotels as well. I yeah, mean, I know. There are a lot more hotels. That's what I'm market. saying. Yeah. But yeah, everybody's doing well. And I think what you said is true. We have created a world where people understand that travel is as beneficial to them as money. And they want to go enjoy experiences and they want to see the world and they want to take their family. And frankly, it's kind of easy to travel right now. We're also primed to travel through social media and the internet, just giving us greater options and greater insight into different parts of the world that we might not have otherwise ever thought of. So we have created a new type of travel and we have created a new traveler. And the demand is there. The demand is strong. Now, I think if there is another recession of some sort that might kind of have any kind of impact on people's ability to travel or their ability to rent their homes and invest in homes, I see people giving up other things before they give up the joy of life. Mm -hmm. And I think they are going to travel as long as they can, even if they do it on a limited income. And I think there are so many people who are renting their homes, primary home or second home or an investment property, that they're willing to take any infusion of travel dollars, even if they take a little bit of a loss for a few years compared to how much money they might be making. Okay, now. so the, su the supply of beds on planet Earth has increased dramatically in the past 10 years. And when the recession comes, and this travel is discretionary, we're going to see what how much of that market is really there, I think. I don't think we know yet. I think this answer is very hard to get to right now in a booming economy. So I think that's going to tell us something. And, you know, what you say may be true. It may not be as big an impact as it would have been in a normal cycle in other times because things have changed. And, you know, one of the trends that I have talked about only a little, but I think it's an interesting one and I think it's significant, is just this concept that life for everybody, largely because of our things, our technology, life has become a lot more portable than it's ever been before. And, you know, I'll just use like a sort of a weird example. You probably think that ah, this is not very significant, but let me just say it, okay? I always had a big stereo system, right? Now I have tiny little devices that have pretty good sound. And, you know, I remember in the old days you had big giant speakers. And, you know, when I move now, I don't have to move all this big stuff. When I used to go on trips, I used to take lots of cassette tapes to listen to audiobooks and a few printed books. And now I just got a laptop and an iPad. You know, it's just a totally different thing. Like things are much more portable nowadays. My first trip to Maui was only a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I landed in Maui and I saw this couple, they were on the same shuttle to the car rental that I was on or something. And I said to them, how are you able to come here for as long as you are? You're, you know, you're coming here for three weeks. I mean, what do you do that you're able to do that? What, what kind of industry do you work in? How are you able to stay involved? And they looked at me like I had asked the strangest question. And at the same time, both with using their left hands, held up their phones. Yeah, and right. Said, it's just right here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people are, are able to work from different parts of the world. And I do think that that adds into the greater conversation about experience and that travelers are seeking experience. I'll give you an anecdote. When I've been talking about short-term rental regulations around the world for you know almost 10 years here, I will talk to the most ardent opponent of short-term rentals, whether it's a neighborhood opponent or an elected official, a city council member, or a mayor that just does not want short-term rentals to proliferate in an extreme manner in their community. They're so you know, serious about the regulations that they want to put in place and maybe even a ban. And then you ask them, do you guys use short-term rentals? 
And without mm-hmm. fail, they say, oh, yeah, we use them all the time. Love them. So they're okay to go somewhere else. And they acknowledge that they enjoy using them when they go other places. I've been in the most hand-to-hand combat on short-term rental regulations when I was on the side of, of industry solely. And I was sitting there saying, guys, you know, there's got to be a better solution that creates real compliance and achieves the goals that you want. And, you know, they weren't seeing it that way. Mm-hmm. And then the minute that discussion, that you know, political uh, dispute was over with, they said, hey, we're going to be going on a trip in the next few weeks. Can you give us some recommendations? <laughs> they, so, sounds like a typical, uh, you know, a typical limousine liberal. You know, it's like, oh, we got a global warming problem, but I love my big SUV. You know, <laughs> you know, you haven't asked me about hotels, but I right. travel for work all the yeah. time, yeah. and I stay places for a night or two right. all the time. Yeah. And I love staying in hotels. I've got a specific brand that mm-hmm. I love. Right. I love staying in them. I went out of my way in the last day in Memphis mm-hmm. just uh, last week to go out of my way to tell the manager how much I love this brand new uh, hotel that they had just built yeah. and the variety of hotel stock that they offer. They are adapting. I had um, one of the execs from uh, Marriott, uh, what do they call it, vacation homes or something. It's their version of short-term rentals like you know, more estate type properties, but the hotels, just the regular hotels are providing a lot of different options. So they're adapting to, you know, it's a, it's capitalism is great. It allocates resources just beautifully, you know, so uh, it does. it's, it's quite interesting. But I will say, yeah. you know, I'm an older man who had a child late in life. My mm-hmm. wife and I, when we travel with this cute little three-year-old now, mm-hmm. my wife, God love her, she will not stay in a hotel room with us for more than one night. Mm-hmm. She'll put up with a night. But she will not do more than that. She wants to get a short-term rental, and here's why. Mm -hmm. That child goes to bed at Mm 7. When you put her to bed in a hotel room, your only option, we learned this the hard way, your only option is to either sit on the side of the bed, plug in your iPads, and sit quietly in the dark and hope she falls asleep on the other side of the bed, the baby does. (laughs) Yeah. Or you go crowd in the bathroom. Right. Now, folks have told me, uh, you know, you can go get a hotel that's got more than one bedroom, but man, I, I've only seen that a handful yeah. of times. Or adjoining rooms. And most, of the time, or, yeah, right. and most of the time, yeah, it's not really a separated bedroom. It's kind of I get it. Yeah. just got an expanded living room. So my wife likes the short-term rental experience with this child. She also, my wife has one great joy in life and it is not me. Mm-hmm. It is her <laughs> cup of coffee in the morning. Yeah. She loves having a cup of coffee in the morning. And how she makes that coffee is so darn important that I am tested every day and it's been five or six years now and how well I make that coffee kind of gauges how the day goes. Yeah. Well, she has a pod and that's mm-hmm. her only option. Yeah. And if that creamer is powdered creamer yeah, and she yeah. doesn't have those kind of creamer she wants. I get it. So, you know, the amenities out. of a home, I totally got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. So wrap it all up for us with, uh, you know, where the industry is going, you know, any predictions you want to say and give out your website. Sure. I mean, a couple of quick things. I just want to make it real clear. I truly believe that every city has the right to create their own regulations. What I want to make sure is that they are looking at this through the lens of best practices, what works and what doesn't, and creating regulations that achieve compliance and knowing all the different tools that are out there. I was just at the U.S. Conference of Mayors where there was a robust conversation about allowing in larger urban areas for the latitude for short-term rental in mixed-use, multifamily commercial zones, your central business district type zones, knowing though that the lower density single-family resident zones might be the greater challenge. So I understand this is unique to different cities. Every city's got their own different challenges, whether it's parking noise, trash, occupancy, insurance inspection, or the millions of other issues that they may have. And so we want to help them go about making these, this, having this discussion and making these decisions based on what works and what doesn't, based on best practices. And there's not a lot of them out there. So we bring our experience to the table. I work with several other former policymakers that all come from local government. You can find us at smartcitypolicygroup.com. And we have a few former mayors on the team, a former city manager, and some other uh, folks that have great skills to be able to uh, uh, help cities out. We have annual events. You can find those at smartcitypolicysummit.com. We'll be having events in Europe and the United States. And we're even talking to folks out in Asia and the Pacific to bring short-term rental regulatory conversations out there. So look up our events. Look us up. Feel free to ask us any questions. We're here to help. Matt, thanks again for joining us. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.